Hi everyone, my name's Ursi and welcome back to my channel. It's been a little while, but I've got some books to talk about, so let's just get started. So I know I've been a little MIA recently, but um, it's just a lot of stuff going on in terms of like personal stuff and I get really consumed with like the news so it's been a little while I know and I've got a lot of background noise too with people blowing leaves as I just started recording this video but we're just gonna roll with it because you know real life <laughs> in this video I'm gonna talk about all the books that I read throughout the month of February what's cool about the month of February is that I wound up participating in February she wrote along with Blackathon and I read some books outside of that as well. It felt really good to be able to read as much as I did. I wound up reading 10 books. Like, who am I? <laughs> who reads 10 books in a month? Not me, uh, but I did. It just felt really good to be able to read as much as I did and knock a lot of books off of my TBR that I've been meaning to get to for a while, along with participating in the readathons and a couple read-alongs as well and joining in on video discussions. So that was a really good time uh, in February. So the first thing I wanna do is talk about February She Wrote. This was an event organized by Ben over at Literature and Lo-Fi, and he did a really great job organizing this event. All it is is just you're reading books by authors who use the she, her pronouns, and it was a good time. Six out of the 10 books that I read were by female authors, I just thought that was awesome and just seeing the amount of interaction on Twitter and Instagram over February she wrote I thought that was just amazing and then Blackathon was organized by Jesse over at Bowties and Books and they organize this event where it's the essential main idea is to read books by black authors. So two of the books that I was able to read this month coincided with <laughs> Blackathon, so that was pretty awesome. I will leave links in the description box for uh, Jesse and Ben so you guys can go check them out. Um, I also was able to talk about a lot of the books that I read for February she wrote in a group panel discussion over on Philip Chase's channel so I will leave that discussion below as well I had a really great time talking with Fine from Fine Reads uh, Bryce from Shelf Centered Ben from Literature and Lo-Fi and uh, Philip Chase as well he hosted it so it was just awesome to be able to talk to everybody on that little panel. Uh, we had a really good time. So I will leave that discussion for you guys to go check out. I think the only other this I think the only other discussion video that I will leave for you guys for now is also the Wolves of the Kala discussion that I had that was over on Stacy's All Books channel. Um, that's, that is the fifth book of the Dark Tower series. Uh, that video will also be linked down below just because it's going to be one of the books that I talk about right now. So let me stop rambling and just get onto the books. As I go through the books, I will tell you what event or read along it coincided with and, uh, my thoughts. I'm going to go backwards from my Goodreads account just because the document that I had, uh, all my stuff on is on my external hard drive and I disconnected it and it doesn't wanna load. So I will just be looking at my phone real quick. So the last book that I wound up reading in the month of February was The Other Black Girl by Zakia Dalila Harris. This is a thriller book written by a black female author. So it was able to satisfy both February She Wrote and Blackathon. And this book I wound up giving three stars to. Uh, like I said, it's a thriller with get out vibes to it. And it involves the world of publishing. The main premise of this book, according to Goodreads, is 26 year old editorial assistant Nella Rogers is tired of being the only black employee at Wagner Books. 
fed up with the isolation and microaggressions, she's thrilled when Harlem born and bred Hazel starts working in a cubicle besides hers. They've only just started comparing natural hair care regimens, though when a string of uncomfortable events elevates Hazel to office darling and Nella is left in dust. Then the notes begin to appear on Nella's desk. Leave Wagner now. And it just goes on about talking about a hostile work environment and stuff. And she has to figure out where these notes are coming from. Um, it has a really great premise. And the book was good. Okay. My only thing with this book was that I felt like it was just a little too long for what it gave. There was a lot of background information about the publishing world that I didn't really think was totally necessary. And I see the connections between the dual timelines that this book had. It had a timeline of the past and the present with previous employees and the current employees and everything that's going on. However, I felt like a lot of it was extra fluff, fluff to build tension that wasn't really necessary and it kind of just dragged like there was just so much of the office politics going on that at the end of the day wasn't even necessary towards the story and it wasn't really that relevant but i really did appreciate this book for talking about all of the microaggressions and the fragility of white people when they're confronted by <laughs> when they're confronted about some of the things that they do um i think it's really important to have those kind of conversations and to see the reactions that people of color receive towards when they're being honest and upfront and the type of backlash that they receive. I thought this book was really great in talking about those kind of things. But as far as the mystery filler revelation twist <laughs> that was revealed, I thought it was a little silly. I'm not going to lie. I won't get into the spoilers, but I mean, it makes sense. But I don't know if it really hit home for me. It was just kind of like, OK, I guess I guess that's what happened kind of reaction that I had to it. It was very well written. It is contemporary so a lot of the language and the prose is very contemporary ish right so it's very of today and now and I thought those conversations about race were good as far as the overall book like it was all right it was good I'm glad I read it being that it got a lot of hype before but I don't know if it's something I would definitely recommend to everyone just because I wasn't blown away by it. I wasn't, um, it, it, it just dragged a little for me. So that's why I gave this book three stars. The next book I want to talk about is All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. And this book is by a non-binary black author. So it satisfies a blackathon. And this book is a nonfiction memoir targeted towards teenagers or young adults. So I'm going to read to you guys what it says on Goodreads. In a series of personal essays, prominent journalist and LGBTQIA plus activist George M. Johnson explores his childhood adolescence and college years in New Jersey and Virginia from the memories of getting his teeth kicked out by bullies at age five to flea marketing with his loving grandmother to his first sexual relationships this young adult memoir weaves together the trials and triumphs faced by black queer boys so this is another book that I'm really glad that I read I gave this one four stars I think I would have given it higher, a higher rating, but I felt like even though the prose, this book is targeted towards teens, I felt like the prose kind of overachieved that. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of slang, a lot of, you know, uh, sayings and stuff that, you know, it's cute, it's relevant. Um, a lot of young people would understand those phrases and stuff I don't know if it's something that truly impresses me that much just because I'm a little older 
but like I understood the book it's not like you know I, I feel like I sound like one of those back in my day we don't talk like this I, I sound ridiculous right now but <laughs> but I felt like it was a really good story in terms of being very honest about their experience growing up and having a very supportive family but facing uh their experiences or, or talking about their experiences out in the real world, like in school, out in society and stuff like that, in university, uh, their experiences with uh, sexual assault, along with their experience of their first relationships and stuff like that. So I thought this was a really great book in talking about those kind of things because in all reality, these are the type of issues and things that teenagers and young adults face. So I don't really see, well, I I understand why people are uh, trying to ban this book in like school libraries and stuff, just because of the, the conversations surrounding the sexual uh, assault and sexual experiences and stuff. Like I, I get, schools not wanting those kind of books in as accessible as <laughs> I'm trying to find the right words I can understand why people are trying to make this book less accessible for young people however I think it sort of backfires because I'm of the opinion that if you tell me I can't read a book or you tell me that my kid can't read a book I'm gonna go look for that book and I'm gonna have <laughs> <laughs> like don't tell me I can't read a book you know what I mean like don't try to take it away from me just because you're uncomfortable with who the author is and what they experience because at the end of the day these are things that teenagers are doing and dealing with so to take that to to take that out of their hands it, it sort of just invalidates those experiences that are being had. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous to be perfectly honest. Like I, I understand where the sensitivity clutching your pearls kind of things it's, it's coming from, but shouldn't we be having those conversations? Shouldn't we be talking about those things? Like why does that make people so uncomfortable to the point where they're trying to have legislation put on these kind of stories? I mean, <laughs> don't even get me started on the Bible. You know what I mean? Like it's to give excuses and permissions towards one kind of literature and and to penalize others for doing the same thing just because the person writing it is different from the norm, right? I really feel like you're just invalidating the experiences of people that are different from society and it's a little ridiculous because then it, it really truly isolates those people that are of those identities and it says that they are not allowed to have their stories they are being silenced and i i really don't like that i'm sorry <laughs> i got really in my i got i got in my feelings there but um I really appreciated the story for being honest and talking about some of the things that the author faced growing up. And I really loved the relationship that the author had with their grandmother and their cousins and stuff and how they had their back um, on certain, you know, issues that was going on, the bullying and everything. So, or even like these reflections on the sexual assault that the author experienced. Um, I really felt like we shouldn't be hiding from this book, you know, it's, it's someone's experience, it's someone's life. So why are we trying to invalidate that experience? You know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's one of those things that like really irritates me about the world we're living in right now. And, um, History is never on the side of people who decide they need to ban books. That's all I'm going to say on that. The next three books are all in the same series, and I don't have them with me because I borrowed them all from my library, and that is volumes one, two, and three of Heartbreaker by Alice Bozeman, and this book uh, satisfies the February She Wrote readathon. I really like these books. 
of books, uh, volumes one and two, I wound up giving five stars to. Volume three, I wound up giving four stars to. And uh, spoiler alert for next month, um, I did read the fourth volume and I wound up giving that one three stars. Like I still like it, but you know, this I'll, I'll talk about the switch. So this is a story about the relationship between two young boys. Uh, they're teenagers and it's a friends to lovers kind of situation. And it was just the sweetest thing to read. It was, it was so sweet and, and genuine. And I feel like that is what I really loved about this series is how genuine it felt, at least the first two books, right? We have Nick and Charlie. Charlie is already out. He's gay and he's dealing with his issues and Nick winds up trying to figure out why he is so drawn to Charlie and you know he comes out as like bisexual right and then it goes on with their relationship so the first two books really centers around that them discovering who they are trying trying to make sense of their feelings towards one another on top of the issues of, you know, dealing with kids at school, what other people think of them. And it was just the sweetest, most genuine <laughs> friendship to a relationship story. I, I thought it was just so sweet. Books three and four kind of make a switch towards being more educational and talking about um, various issues that teenagers deal with. And I can, I can appreciate those books for that. I don't know if I'm the target audience for that, just because, like I said, I'm a little older. I guess it's good in terms of being aware of that as well when it comes to encountering teenagers in real life, like in my family or when my daughter gets older and stuff. However, I don't know if it was news to me. <laughs> I feel like that sounds kind of harsh. I, I didn't gain as much from it. If anything, I'm just kind of following along with the story of these two characters that I really grew to love from the first two volumes. But volumes three and four made that switch to like educational stuff. And I don't know if, I don't know. It, it's like, I felt like I was just reading it to find out what happens. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a very sweet series. It's so cute. I understand why people really enjoy these uh, graphic novels and I do actually recommend them just because they're so sweet. The next book I'm going to talk about didn't satisfy either of those readathons <laughs> and that is Gardens of the Moon by Steven Erickson. I will leave the link to the discussion that we had over on Steve Talks Books channel. Um, Steve Talks Books and stuff. <laughs> uh, he wound up hosting the discussion for this book. We did a read along with a really great group of people. Uh, as far as who was there, it was um, Steve, uh, Jolene from Jolene Reads, uh, Philip Chase joined in on the conversation to help explain some of the stuff that we were confused about, uh, Stacy's All Booked, uh, Joseph Carroll, he's a writer, and uh, Leila Gauchi, she is on Twitter and she is a professor of literature. And we had a really great discussion. Let me just talk about this book real quick. So this is an epic fantasy. It's the first book of a very long series. It's like 10 books long. So I don't know what I was thinking committing to this. <laughs> However, it really took a long time for me to get into the writing style of this, but I understand it now. And now that I'm reading the second book, I feel like I'm going through it a lot faster because I, I, under, I understand how Steven Erickson is setting up this book as far as like the structure and everything. So he has multiple viewpoints, multiple sides going on, right? Super complex. You have various storylines that wind up intersecting somehow towards the end of the book or in the middle and all over the place. <laughs> so it is a very, very interesting writing style. And you'll start reading like a section of a chapter and then you find out like three paragraphs later who he's actually talking about. And so then you have to go back and reread part of it to make sense of like who he was talking about. <laughs> it was a struggle. However, 
I appreciated the conversation that we had over on Steve's channel because I feel like we pulled a lot of the positive out of this and there was a lot of positive that I found in this book. But I can understand why people have reservations in terms of approaching this book and the series um, because it is rather dense. But this is a story about the Malazan Empire and they are trying to conquer the world, right? They're trying to conquer various cities and territories in order to expand the empire. There's a lot of politics and war going on, scheming. And um, as we're getting to know these characters and their abilities, um, their paths intersect all over the place throughout this book we learn about various races and the abilities of certain characters and the different kinds of magic uh, that's going on. It's very mysterious in terms of the sources of the magic and the, the ways that people are able to be in touch with that sort of magic. It's, it's really complicated, but I, I get it. You know, and I'm already like 50 some flat pages in <laughs> the next book, which is Dead House Gates. And we're going to be having that discussion in April. So I still have some time, but I need to get going because um, the time will creep faster <laughs> than what I always expect. And then I always wind up scrambling right before a certain discussion because I didn't finish in time. <laughs> but um, I, I, I had more a, a more positive experience than I actually expected with this series so I wouldn't recommend this book to people who are just getting into fiction just getting into reading uh, fantasy just because of how complex it is um, but if you're up for a challenge go for it because it's a pretty cool story um, it's just the writing style is pretty complex and it takes a minute to get used to it. So that's just something that I would keep in mind and advice for anyone that's trying to approach this series. Three more books. I will talk about this one very quickly. This is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. This was a reread for me. This is a young adult book written in verse about a young girl named Xiomara in high school battling with faith, her mother, trying to find her passions in poetry, her relationships with people around her, um, the things that she experiences just living as a curvy girl in New York City. A beautifully written book that I absolutely love. This was a reread for me. I wound up doing um, the best chapter tag utilizing this book and I will leave that video link for you guys as well. This book is just always a joy because I relate to it so much and I will stop talking about it because I talk about it all the time. <laughs> Last book that I will mention that uh, satisfied of uh, February she wrote is 10 Days in Madhouse by Nellie Bly. And this is a very short book that was an expose on the mental institutions of the late 1800s, early 1900s in New York City. I had always read about this book, being that, you know, like I taught history and stuff. So a lot of the expose books and stuff, like I had like a whole lesson unit on these kind of things, um, like The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, uh, this book, um, you know, like a few other ones or whatever. But these sort of narratives have had a lasting impact on you know legislation policies the way that we view certain um bureaucratic institutions so a lot of good came out of this book but i had actually never read it i've only read like excerpts of it before and i was really glad that i i, I actually got to read this book for february she wrote because it really talked about not only just the state of mental institutions during this time, but the way that women are viewed during this time. And I, I talked about it during my, our discussion on February, she wrote, so I won't get too much into it so you guys can go check that out. But I just think this whole idea of 
you know, how easy it is for people to be classified as crazy, insane, um, especially women, right? Like they're not taken seriously. Um, you can easily fool people into believing that you're not all there and then get locked away forever because there's no way you can prove your sanity or you're not given ample opportunities to do so or you're not taken seriously. And I feel like that was one of the biggest things that I took from this because nowadays, you know, there's a lot of accountability in terms of, you know, various institutions. And, and it's not to say that abuse doesn't happen because it does, but there's more accountabilities because of surveillance and stuff. So, and in visitor policies, I think that we should be aware of that and not forget about these people that get locked away. But I, I, what I really took out of it was the perceptions of women during this time. I thought that, that it was good to read about in February for February, she wrote. So it was a relevant issue to kind of discuss with the group. But I do recommend this book. It, it reads like a story, like a narrative. Like she's talking about like something that happened, something that happened to her because she did commit herself like she wound up fooling people into believing that she was crazy and then she gets locked away and then you know 10 days later she gets released it was a really short story like i had it was readily available for my library it was a three hour long audiobook um i do recommend it's it's very it's a very easy read so um if you're interested in that topic i would recommend it Last book I will talk about in this video didn't satisfy either of the readathons, but it, it was as part of my Dark Tower read along with everyone that's still doing it. And that is Wolves of the Kala by Stephen King, book five of the Dark Tower series. So I finished this one very early in February and then we had the discussion. And then in beginning of March, we had the discussion for Songs of Susanna, which is book six. But Wolves of the Kala was really, really cool. Um, again, I'll have a link to that discussion so you can go check it out if you want. But I really, really enjoyed this one. I gave this one four stars. Yes, I gave it four stars. We have sort of this side quest kind of thing going on with this book. But again, always tons of character development. We have the introduction of Father Callahan. Um, I sort of did myself a disservice by not reading Salem's Lot, but now I really want to read Salem's Lot because that's where Father Callahan comes from. And so there's that tie in there, but I really had a good time with this one, despite there not being as much movement as I was expecting towards the Dark Tower. But I really appreciated where Stephen King went with this one. So. As I discussed in that discussion, <laughs> don't you hate when you do that, when you use two forms of the word, but it's like the same word in the same sentence? I need to work on my vocabulary. But anyways, <laughs> when I picked up this book, I had expected a certain type of progression towards the Dark Tower. It did not meet my expectation as far as that. However, I really appreciated what was done in this book and, and I had a good time reading this one. It read really fast despite it being almost 700 pages long. Uh, it read a lot faster than that um, just because like you already know who these characters are. You're getting backstory on Father Callahan and there's sort of like this breakdown of the quartet and then them trying to regroup and but even that breakdown was sort of necessary in order to make them even closer, right? Like you just love the relationships that these characters have, you know, Eddie, Susanna, um, Jake, Oi, and Roland, right? And now Father Callahan. So I, I'm just really loving this series because it's so character driven. It's I love it. The plot can stay exactly where it is. And I just want to talk about their relationships with each other <laughs> the whole time. Um, but it was a good read. I really, I really enjoyed uh, reading um, Wolves of the Color. 
So those were all the books that I wound up reading in February. Um, I know I'm a little late in posting this because in posting this because it's almost the end of March. So I'm gonna be making a video soon about all the books I read in March. But I really wanted to talk about all of these amazing books that I read. And on top of that, it's been a little while since I've posted anything on my channel, right? So I just wanted to get this all out to you guys and recommend these books because I had a really great time um, reading every single one of them. If you've read any of these books, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear your opinions on any of these books or even if you're interested in any of them. Please go check out all of those amazing discussions if you want. Um, I will have them linked for you guys in the description box um, for you guys to go check out. And I want to say thank you to everyone who had me on their channels for these discussions because um, I know it's a lot of work to put these discussions together and all I have to do is just click a link and show up <laughs> so I'm just very happy that they uh, put in that work and I was able to participate and in, in sharing the discussions with all of these amazing beautiful awesome booktubers that I've been getting to know uh, throughout this past year so with that if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe if you want to see more. I hope you all have an amazing day and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.